Hi, I'm Dave Baring, Technical Director here at TriStar, and welcome to another Tech Talk. Today we're going to be doing something a little different in that we're going to do a short seminar on designing plane bearings with polymers. And so to start, let's talk about what is a plane bearing. Uh, at TriStar, we talk about plane bearings and spell it a little differently than the rest of the world. We spell it P-L-A-N-E, and the reason that we do that is because we look at uh, bearings in terms of their geometric values. Uh, most everybody else looks at uh, plane bearings with uh, the spelling of plane, P-L-A-I-N, which is also true because these types of bearings are very plain and simple in form. But again, we like to look at it in terms of its uh, geometric uh, value, and that is very simply any place where you have two surfaces rubbing together is in fact a plane bearing. And the nomenclatures can be different, the sleeve bearings, flange bearings, bushings, slide pads, friction pads, all of these are different types of descriptions of just what a plane bearing is. The bottom line is a plane bearing is any non-rolling element uh, bearing support system. Now, the thing that plane bearings offer in terms of advantages are that they are very simple in design. They're self-lubricating because, again, we're using all polymers. They have a very wide variety of, uh, of operating parameters, a very wide range of services. They're simple to install and remove, and as a rule, they're lower cost than a rolling element bearing. All plane bearing designs are a matter of material selection, and there's some very simple things that we need to take a look at before we determine which material we're going to select for your application. The first thing is the load. And we'll be talking about each one of these more specifically, but in, in terms of a plane bearing, when we talk about load, we're talking about the anticipated uh, bearing load that is going to be supported by that very simple IDOD uh, component. Secondly is the speed. How fast is the bearing moving? Uh, and also what form is that motion? Is it rotary? Is it linear? Is it oscillating? Third is the temperature. And we talk in terms of both normal operating temperatures, uh, but then secondarily we also want to know what are the minimums and maximums. Because all plastics are insulative in nature, uh, they do have a tendency to hold heat more than metallic bearings would, obviously. So we need to know what the minimum operating is, the maximum operating temperature, and then also what the normal operating conditions are. And then finally, what is the environment? Um, is it a wet environment? Is it dry? Is it uh, abrasives? Are there chemicals involved? Just what's going on around that plane bearing? Now let's take a look first at loads. Uh, this is one of the more critical components, and uh, we're going to talk about loads in terms of P rating. You, you're probably familiar with the uh, PB uh, when it comes to plane bearings. Well, we're going to talk first about the P value. And when we look at uh, plane bearings, we're really interested in finding out uh, what is the load being carried on the ID times the length, because that is what our actual uh, surface contact area is. So it's very simple to find out what your P value is by simply taking the ID of the bearing, multiplying it times the length, and then uh, taking the known load. Uh, and we know that that value can sometimes be a little confusing because while you may know the shaft load and you may know the gears and the sprockets and the belts and the pulleys and the drives, all of that accumulates to uh, produce your total load. And sometimes that diffi that's difficult to uh, really uh, come up with. So we um, try and ascertain exactly what uh, the closest value is that you can come up with and um, and then take that value and divide it by the known surface contact area which is your ID times the length. So let's let's take an example for instance uh, if you've got a two inch shaft um, your bearing is two inches long um, you've got 2 times 2 is 4, so your usable surface contact area is 4 square inches. <clears throat> now, keeping it simple still, let's take, let's take a, a load consideration of, say, 400 pounds. 
that 400 pounds divided by your four surface uh, inches of, of contact area, 4 into 400 is 100, so your p-value for your application would be 100. Now the next point is speed. Speed's a little bit easier because now we're talking about something that's a known. You know what your shaft speed is, uh, whether that's rotary or oscillating. Uh, if it's a linear motion, you know what your feet per minute is in reciprocation. So uh, in order to find out what your v-value is, or your velocity, uh, we need to find out exactly how many surface feet per minute are uh, involved in your application. So let's take that same two-inch shaft that we use for the P. Uh, you take that two-inch diameter shaft, multiply it times pi, 3.14. Uh, that gives you a total circumferential inches um, that your bearing is going to be seeing. And then you multiply that times the actual speed in RPM. So again, using the two inches as an example, uh, let's say your RPM is 100 uh, RPM. You got two inch times pi, 3.14, so round numbers say six. Multiply that times 100 RPM. Your total circumferential inches is 600. You now take that number, divide it by 12, which gives you your surface feet per minute. That is your V value. So we now have a P, we now have a V, and the next critical part of this equation is determining what that combined number is. The reason we have to do that is because each one of these values, P, V, and PV, has to be looked at individually. Uh, you can't just simply take your P times V and, and use that PV as your working number. Um, there are situations where you have some of the higher end materials, for instance, that could have um, a PV of 300,000, but the P might be 1,000 and the V might be 600. You can't multiply those two together and that's your useful number. You have to stay within the means of each one of those numbers independently. So in the case of this example, we have um, uh, 100 feet per minute. Um, we have 100 PSI. 100 times 100 gives us 10,000 PV. So now we can take a look at what is readily available in, in, um, in this simple material rating. And you can see that there are some materials that will meet that PV rating no problem. The V rating is no problem. The P rating is no problem. Those are the materials that we can now take a look at as the potential materials for your application. Um, this is the process that we have to go through with each and every application. But it's very, very critical because if you exceed any of these values, the thing that's going to happen is you're going to generate a huge amount of heat. And again, because plastics are insulative in nature, there's no place for the heat to go, and heat will kill a plastic bearing faster than anything else. So pay attention to your P, your loads, your V, your speed, and then the combined value of those two uh, components. And if you stay within the known um, uh, quantities that these materials are capable of taking, you will have a successful plane bearing application. Now the next part of this equation is, uh, is looking at temperatures. And again, we have to look at temperatures uh, for the simple reason that we need to know what the continuous operating conditions are going to be, and then what are the downside and the upside of those temperature ranges going to be. And the reason we need to know that is to be sure that we get the proper press fits. Uh, you know, plane bearings are really all held in place by a press fit. And then also being sure that we don't um, expose that bearing to a close in on the shaft. Um, when you press fit a bearing into a housing, um, there's really no place for it to go outward, so it's all going to close in on the shaft. So we need to be sure that if the temperature goes up uh, in your application or there is a certain amount of frictional heat that's been being generated, that doesn't cause us any issues with close in and a loss of tolerance. So understanding completely what your operating temperatures are going to be are very critical um, in, in determining exactly what uh, we're going to experience in terms of close ends, running tolerances, and press fits. 
Um, now, uh, every plastic material has a maximum operating temperature. Um, the numbers that you're seeing here on this particular graph are fairly, fairly conservative, but these are numbers that we're comfortable with when we're designing, and you can see there's a very broad range. Um, some of the higher end materials we can actually push to much higher temperatures. In fact, there is one material out there that we can, we can push to 1100 degrees Fahrenheit in air in very short term exposures. Um, there are other materials that we can take down to uh, liquid nitrogen, liquid oxygen temperatures and work very, very successfully. So the trick here is, is determining um, what the maximum operating temperature is you're going to be seeing or in the case of cold temperature applications, what the minimum temperature you're going to be seeing and be sure that we don't uh, go beyond or uh, below uh, the capability of that particular material. Now, again, because plastic plane bearings are dependent on press fit, thermal expansion is a very critical component. And as you can see from this chart, um, there is a huge variation in, in thermal expansion properties. There are some plane bearing materials that are very, very close to steel. Um, those, obviously, are the materials that are much easier to design around because there's really no influence of the hardware on how the material is going to uh, function thermally. Um, you always do still have the consideration of the bearing being an insulator, so it will hold heat at the bearing surface contact area, but when you have materials that have very low thermal expansion rates, it does allow us to work with much closer tolerances, and that takes away a lot of the other issues like misalignment, uh, and things like that that can also cause, uh, cause short, short life. Uh, but as you can see from this, this particular chart, um, there are some materials, like I said, that are very close to steel and aluminum. There are other materials that are 10, 12 times greater than steel. So those materials are the ones, obviously, you have to be a little bit more sensitive to um, tolerances. You can't take, for instance, a UHMW bearing and put it into uh, 180 degree Fahrenheit application, which is its top end operating temperature, and expect to be able to hold two or three thousandths tolerances. It's just not going to happen. And so these are the factors that we have to consider, again, right along with P and V and PV, and with the operating temperature, thermal expansion is yet another issue that we need to take a very close look at um, as we work with you on design. Now, um, one of the big advantages of, of plain bearings is that they're very versatile. Um, we have materials that will work in uh, abrasive uh, applications like you know, coal dust and quartz slurry, uh, sewage treatment plants where there's a lot of uh, debris, uh, very coarse debris, um, applications in clean rooms where you don't have those issues of abrasion, uh, but you do have issues with the bearing potentially producing slough that can uh, be a problem in a clean room environment. There are other materials that uh, have uh, very high dielectric values and so they're used for both dielectric insulators or or perhaps there's other materials that are uh, best suited for thermal insulation or thermal conductivity. Um, so there, the variety of materials that is available uh, specifically for plain bearing applications uh, gives us the capability to really address the key issues that you have in your application. So when we ask you for uh, these questions regarding the environment, uh, we will get a little specific about it. You know, what kind of acids, if it's an acid environment? What are the concentrations? What are the temperatures? Uh, there are some materials that will do very well at room temperature in 20% in hydrochloric acid, uh, but you put that same application at uh, 180 degrees and all bets are off. So um, these are all key things that we'll ask you that we'll uh, try and dial in along with you to be sure that we uh, understand fully the application and uh, give you the best opportunity for success uh, right out of the box. Now, one of the questions that we get a lot 
uh, is, is how exactly do self-lubricating plane bearings work. Um, and there's two basic systems of self-lubrication. Um, the first one is called uh, smearing. Um, we call it smearing because basically what's happening is uh, what is better known in the tribology world as third body transfer where the lubricating media in that polymer, whether it be PTFE or Teflon, um, graphite, silicone, moly, whatever that lubricating media is, is allowed to uh, transfer out uh, in microscopic uh, quantities uh, to where it actually embeds in the mating surface area. Um, and that's one of the reasons, by the way, that we have very specific recommendations on uh, what the mating surface should be. Because what we're trying to accomplish here is that transfer media embedding itself into that little micro finish on your shaft or on your slide pad so that you get, in essence, a hydrodynamic film of that lubricating media. Um, if you look at wear charts for many of these materials, especially the ones that have these transfer type uh, smearing systems, you'll, you'll see that the wear really takes place in the first few hours of contact. Um, that's because once that break-in has occurred and that lubrication has now embedded, uh, you start to see more of a gradual wear pattern, uh, even flattening out a bit uh, over time. Um, this is a classic example of smearing systems at their best. Um, but the things that are critical are um, the surface finish of the mating material. Uh, we also are concerned sometimes about what type of material it is. Is it stainless? Is it steel? Is it aluminum? Uh, this will have some bearing on temperature, um, you know, how much, how much heat transfer is capable through the mating material. Um, we also are concerned about hardness. Uh, obviously, the harder the better. Um, there are some materials that will work very well against even brass. Uh, they're totally non-abrasive and they can work very well against uh, very soft surfaces. There are other materials, however, that do tend to be a little bit more abrasive. So we will ask for harder uh, mating surfaces to be sure that we don't introduce rapid wear in that, uh, in that metal surface. Um, some of the other things that we, we uh, take a look at in terms of um, plane bearings and how this, uh, this transfer takes place is actual loading. Um, a, a good example is uh, PTFE-based materials like the Rulons or the Fluorescents or Ultraflons. These materials are primarily PTFE. Uh, and they have fillers in them that will help reinforce that PTFE, um, make it stronger, make it less, less apt to cold flow under compression. Um, these additives also add dielectric values. Some of them will also add heat transfer values. There's a lot of different things that we can do with PTFE to enhance its performance. But one of the unique things about PTFE uh, bearings is that the higher the load, the lower the friction, and that flies in the face of a lot of uh, a lot of uh, conventional wisdom. But that is a fact of life when it comes to these types of bearings, um, especially the smearing type systems. We need a certain amount of load to accomplish that transfer, so that we get the lowest possible friction, which then in turn produces the least amount of heat and ultimately the least amount of wear. So load, surface finish, hardness of the mating shaft, um, even speeds can be an influence um, on these types of smearing systems. All of these come into play um, as we look at your application uh, to determine whether this type of material, this type of transfer system is the best one for your application. Now, smearing systems are very efficient, and again, these are the ones that primarily have things like PTFE, graphite, silicone, and moly. Those are the four primary uh, lubricants. The other type of system is a, is a bit more mechanical. It's called the debris uh, system, and that is essentially um, some of the more durable materials, things like Nylotron, uh, UHMW, 
Uh, these are materials that are very durable, very strong mechanically. Um, and the way that you get your lubrication is you're actually breaking off very small, again, microscopic particles that rather than embedding, have more of a tendency to ball up, where in fact you can almost consider it to be little microspheres, ball bearings of particles that are there functioning as your low friction surface. Um, and that is also your lubricating media. All of these materials that are debris type systems are inherently low friction. They will also have additives in them. Uh, PTFE and MOLLE are very common with some of these types of systems. So um, debris systems, again, uh, also very efficient because of the types of materials. Um, you know, the, the thoughts are that these materials will tend to slough off debris faster. Uh, that is true, but because these materials tend to be more mechanically sound, um, they can stand up for a much longer period uh, while still generating that debris. So two very distinctly different forms of lubrication. Uh, both very efficient for the types of materials that are being utilized. Um, and in some ways, those types of lubrication systems also come down to cost. The um, uh, types of systems that are more smearing related tend to be the higher end materials. Um, so as with everything else, cost efficiencies are very, very much the same with uh, non-metallic self-lubricating materials. So just to recap, um, plain bearing design is, is fairly simple. Um, plain bearings are simple, the design factors are fairly simple, but they need to be paid attention to. So when we work with you on determining which of these materials is the best choice for you, um, keep these, these six areas in mind. The P or bearing load values, the velocity, the V value, uh, the combined PV, what's the temperature, what the temp temperature variations, and then finally, what is the environment. If we pay attention to those factors and take a look at each one of those uh, at their face values and understand which of these materials are best suited for those particular parameters, you will have a successful plane bearing application. Thank you for joining us. I look forward to seeing you in another Tech Talk in the near future.